Good morning to everybody joining Researchers Excellence Network uh, virtual event. Uh, I'm very happy to present that this week uh, is the international um, week of Erasmus Plus program in Shuli University, Lithuania. And therefore, we have several guests visiting Shuli University and giving public lectures to uh, our members of Researchers Excellence Network as well as uh, for Shuli University community. So um, I'm very happy and pleased to present you today's uh, lecturer, professor from uh, the University of Tolima in Colombia, uh, from the Department of Forestry. So, Professor uh, Miguel Cardona, he will uh, present his presentation with a specific topic, very interested and very um, very important for nowadays society as well as for saving the environment. And uh, we are very happy that today's uh, moderators um, will be uh, giving the floor for the presenter as well for students and community inside the room. I would like to rem uh, remind everybody who are connected to this event via internet that you have the possibility to give some uh, questions for the presenter or to give some insights for the discussion using the chat field uh, online. And I'm very happy to present you as well um, the, my colleague, the moderator, Dr. Martinez Kozlaskos from Shulin University. We will try to moderate the discussion. So, uh, thank you very much, Professor, for coming, uh, for this opportunity to hear your presentation. And now we will ask you to make uh, this your speech. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Okay, right. Uh, thank you again. Uh, my name is Miguel Angel Quimbayo Cardona. I'm coming from Colombia, and I would like to uh, say thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I will try to speak in English all my presentation. Uh, it's not usual for me to speak English because we talk in Spanish in Colombia. And it's not usual for me to speak English all the time. Uh, my topic presentation uh, has this name, Wildlife Management and Conservation in Natural Forest Ecosystems. As I told you, I came from the University of Tolima, that is uh, located in, in the center of Colombia. I come from the Faculty of Forest Engineering, and I, ha I am a professor there and from 2006. Uh, I am a leader or head of this uh, group research called Biodiversity and dynamic of ecosystem of tropical ecosystems. Uh, I am the head too of the Department of Forestry Sciences, and this topic that I will going to present as a lecture is a course that I begin this year with students of seventh uh, level of the forest engineering and. It's an optative course. It's an optative course uh, and it's the first course in English that we have at the faculty and that we have into the University of Tolima. Uh, we have different programs of languages into the university, but it's the first uh, professional course uh, that we have in English. So. These are the contents of my presentation. We are going to talk about biodiversity policy that is very important uh, when we are talking about uh, conservation and management, wildlife, ecosystem, wildlife analysis, management and conservation strategies, and wildlife stu studies in natural forest ecosystems. So we are going to speak about biodiversity. 
Well, diversity of our biological diversity is a variation of all kinds of life and displays as genetic diversity, species diversity, population diversity, ecosystem diversity, or landscape diversity. We have a definition that were, was the result of the uh, com convenio of biological diversity in 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. And it means, biodiversity means the variability among living organisms from all sources, including interalia, terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystems, and the ecological complexes of which they are part. This includes diversity within species, between species, and of ecosystems. So diversity in species is the most used level to, uh, that is related with richness. Uh, richness is a quantity of species that we can find in a determined uh, place. And is the most dominant criteria to establish conservation priorities. So if we have more uh, species into a natural landscape or into a natural ecosystem, we can use that information for priority conservation. This is the logo of Convention of Biological Diversity that was signed by 150 countries in 1992, and it has three aims. The first of all is the conservation of biological diversity, the sustainable use of the components of biological diversity, and the fair and equitable sh sharing of the benefits arising out of the utilization of genetic resources. It is important for studies of biodiversity to value, to value biological, social, and cultural roots, not only biological, but social and cultural, because uh, nature is surrounded by different uh, cultures and different kind of populations, human populations. If we can do this, we can contribute to educate communities aware and responsible to make decisions over natural environment, societies, and cultures who share the natural territories. We can find around the world 17 mega diverse countries. Here is a map of our planet. And we can find that more than 70% of the Earth's biodiversity could be found in these areas called mega, mega, mega diversity countries. It was the result of a meeting in Cancun called Cancun Initiative in 2002 and declaration of like-minded mega diverse countries. They have three focuses that are access to genetic resources, distribution of benefits, and respect and protection of traditional knowledge. So we can find two, uh, what we call hotspots, biodiversity hotspots. Biodiversity hotspots are areas that had a, had a lot of biodiversity, but they have to uh, a, a great risk for their conservation. So 44% of all species of vascular plants and 35% of all species for verte of vertebrates groups are confined in 25 hotspots comprising only 1.4% of the land surface of the earth. So we can find this percentage of biodiversity in 25 hotspots around the world. There are two criteria important to define or to uh, decided if an area could be a hotspot or not. One of them is an area must contain at least 0.5% or 1,500 of the world's 3,100 3, plant species as endemic. 15 of 25 hotspots contain at least 2,500 endemic plant species, and 10 of them at least 
5,000 species. The second criteria is that hotspots should have lost 70% or more of its primary vegetation. 11 hotspots have already lost at least 90% and three of them have, have, list, have lost at least 95%. Nowadays, there are no 25 hotspots. There are 34 hotspots that have been identified as places of biodiversity, vulnerability, and irreplaceability. We can find here the 25 hotspots uh, founded by Myers in 2000. And it's important to show that the first eight uh, hotspots are located in America. We are talking about tropical Andes, Mesoamerica, or Central America, Caribbean, Brazil's Atlantic Forest, Chocó Darien, Western Ecuador, is at the Pacific, Brazil Cerrado, Central Brazil is at the Pacific too, and California Floristic Providence at the United States. Uh, we can find here the original extent of primary vegetation, the remaining primary vegetation in percentage. We can find here area protected in kilometer square, the quantity of plant species, the richness of plant species, and the endemic plant, endemic plants in percentage, and the quantity of vertebrate species. At the end, we can find this uh, file with endemic species of vertebrates. When they are talking about vertebrates, they are talking about four groups, four principal groups that are amphibia, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Why this? Uh, why these groups? Because it's the, the most uh, information or reports that are founded around the world is into these four groups. Insects, fish, and other kind of groups uh, of animals is not so popular and are not so common. So they use these four groups. Here we can find information of these four groups. Bird species. We have the total of species in each one of these uh, hotspots, the percentage or the quantity of species, endemic species for mammals, for reptiles and amphibians, and we have the total here. And we find again the first eight hotspots related here in this information are from America. But we have found uh, the hardest hotspots, and there are four key factors. One of them is the number of endemic plants. We already talked about it. The second is the number of endemic vertebrates. The third is the number of endemic species per area ratio for plants, and the number of endemic species per area ratio for, verte for vertebrates. We can find this. Uh, hardest hot, hot spots, but some of them are located in America, like Brazil's Atlantic Forest, Caribbean, and no more. We find here the endemic plants and endemic vertebrates, and we have here the area radio per species, and this information is a uh, very important to decide conservation priorities again and to know if we are really conserving our biodiversity around the world. I have this uh, information about Colombia, where I come from. Uh, Colombia is located at the north of South America, and we have uh, an interesting biodiversity. We have in Colombia a continuity of the Andean, tropical Andean uh, mountains, chain mountains, that is divided in three chain mountains that called East Mountain, Central Mountain, and West Mountain. We have a valley here. We have a valley that 
uh, across a river called Magdalena that goes to uh, Atlantic Ocean. And we have another river here that is the Cauca River that uh, goes to Magdalena River and after to Atlantic Ocean. So we can find this information for Colombia. We have a surface of 2,071,748 kilometers square. We have about 0.8% of continental surface and 11% of planet biodiversity. We have these ecosystems. Sorry, it does. Can we shut the light for a while? We have different ecosystems here in Colombia, different cover, nature cover, and we can find maybe if I read from here, it's better. Dry forests. The information is in nectarious, and dry forests are this kind of vegetation. They are located in into zero meters and 1,000 meters above the level of the sea, and the vegetation is no more, no longer than 25 or 30 meters. Uh, here is the lower part of the mountain, and we have another kind of vegetation that is an Andean forest. We can find humid forests. Where can we find where we can find this kind of big trees that are used in natural forest ecosystems for logging, and and they have they don't have biomass at the at the ground, and they have uh, trees tall as fifty or maybe sixty meters. We can find this kind of forests here in the Amazonia that is shared with Brazil, Ecuador, and Peru. And we can find these uh, humid forests here at the Pacific in the Chocó. We have Andean forests that are located from 1,000 meters to 2,600 meters uh, above the level of the sea, and they ha they are a lot of they have a lot of humidity, and we have very uh, great areas for conservation in this kind of forests. These forests are located into the mountain chain mountains, as we can see here. This is uh, Andean forest in this mountain. We can find the same here and we can find the same here. Because we can, we have this uh, geologic formation. We know that uh, diversity of plants and species could change from here to here and from here to here. We can find different kinds of species in each one of these chain mountains. We have another ecosystem called mangroves that is uh, located in estuarine zones where uh, rivers find with uh, ocean. It's not a tall vegetation, but it's a dense vegetation. And this is a an example of the roots, how they can find in this ecosystem. We have this vegetation that is uh, one of our most important vegetation or ecosystem called Paramo. Paramo uh, is an area located up upper the uh, tropical Andes, about 2,700 meters to 3,400 meters. So it's a very cold place because of the altitude and it's a natural source water that uh, create rivers 
that goes from the upper mountains to the valleys. We have wetlands too, and these wetlands are related to low, slow, lower areas near to rivers, and they have a different kind of vegetation. is not so uh, dense, and they are not so tall too. We have savanna at the west, at the east of the of Colombia. Savanna is an open areas that have has uh, some trees uh, surrounded, but is, they are very dispersed into the savanna. This is the area where we can find savannas. We have deserts, uh, two different deserts uh, in Colombia that are located between 100 meters and 300 meters and is another classification of dry forest because they don't have uh, much humidity and they don't have a lot of precipitation. We have glacial, so we can find some volcanoes as this. This is the Ruiz volcano, and they are called nevados. We can find some snow at the top of the mountain, and these are located upper the area of Paramos. This is the Paramo. All of this is the valley of the Paramo, and up and upper we can find the the glacial. They are found at 5,000 meters or 4,500 4, meters. Shrubs. Shrubs is another kind of vegetation in areas that are, has been deforested uh, in natural forests, especially in dry forests and they are another kind of uh, vegetation that could be a connectors or a corridors for different species. We can find secondary vegetation that has open areas in different kind of forests, maybe dry forests, maybe uh, Andean forests, humid, humid forests, and they have uh, a lot of intervention because of the populations or the communities that lives around it. We can find forest plantations. We have different kind of species, eucalyptus. We have pine trees too. And we have this kind of species that is from India called Melina, Melina arborea. It's a species that is used recently uh, to activities, forestry activities. A different kind of cultures. We can find here a, a great area of coffee culture. We are one of the most important producers of coffee around the world. Uh, not the first producer, not the first ex export country, but we are the first in uh, quality of coffee. The better quality of coffee is from Colombia, but the uh, first country that exports coffee around the world is Brazil. And this is important because coffee is located into about 100 and 2,000 meters above the level of the sea until maybe 100 and 1,800 meters, that is the area of the Andean, Andean tropics, yes, forest Andean tropics. So this is a reason for deforestation of this kind of ecosystem. So we are proud for our coffee, but we are finishing our forest too. We found here two grasslands. Grasslands is a kind of savanna that 
without trees uh, around this area, and we have some wetlands uh, near of these areas of uh, grasslands. These grasslands could be found These grasslands could be found here too, at the east of Colombia. Okay, so as you can see, we have a lot of ecosystems and we have a lot of areas, different areas, uh, different covers, so we can find different vegetation communities. We have at least 366 phytosociological associations and vegetation communities, and we have found at least 1,880 vegetation communities. In Paramo, we can find 339 communities of vegetation. In Andean Forest, we can find 236 communities because we have three different chain mountains, and the, the biodiversity there is very great. In humid forests of Amazonia, we can find 193 communities. In savannas and grasslands, we can find 164 communities. In humid Pacific, in humid forest, it's the same here, but here, here is Amazonia at the south, and here is the Pacific at the west. Uh, we can find 129 communities. And in dry forests at the Caribbean, we can find 127 communities of vegetation. About other groups of bio, for biodiversity, not only plants, we have plants here, we have 29,782 uh, species of plants. We can find this kind of information for different groups. We have here Imenoptera that are ants and bees. We have here coleoptera that are beetles, orchids. I'm going to show you one orchid uh, at the next slides. Lepidoptera that are butterflies. We can find freshwater fishes. We can find mollusks. We can find birds, uh, lichens, ferns, uh, marine fishes, mollusks. Mm, we have here hepatic amphibians, decapods, reptiles, and mammals. So we are trying always to work or to study the four principal groups of vertebrates, of vertebrates that are amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. So we can find this information about what is the position of Colombia worldwide. We can find that Colombia has the third position around the world in quantity of species of plants. The first is Brazil. This is a Mayflower, this is an orchid, is the Colombian mm, flower, our, our, our representation of uh, nature. In amphibia, we can find that we are the first uh, world, the first country in the world, in species, we can find this frog, this golden frog is found in humid forests at the Pacific a humid forest. We can find reptiles, this is a rattlesnake uh, that we can find in dry forests. We can find birds as this, tucano, uh, in uh, tropical Andes. And we can find some mammals as this that is endemic of my region, of my state, that is called Tolima, as the name of my university. And this is a little monkey mm, that is a white-footed tamarind. What we have about not only quantity of species or richness, but what we have about endemic species and threatened species. We can find 1,500 plants that are endemic, and this is an information of threatened species. We can find this information for Lepidoptera or butterflies, for birds, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. 
uh, this is the uh, information most uh, studied or the groups more studied around the around my country and we have a lot of uh, richness of other species as I saw as I, as I show you but this is the principal groups that are studied for threatened and for endemic okay I'm finishing this information about biodiversity for Colombia and I have some information that I found in internet uh, very several years ago and I found very important if you want to know the Caribbean go to Cuba or Republica Dominicana if you want to know the Pacific Ocean go to Chile if you want to know the Amazonian rainforest go to Brazil if you want to know the tropical Andes go to Ecuador if you want to know the cultures of pre-Columbian era go to Mexico or Peru but if you want to see all together you must go to Colombia we have a lot of biodiversity, not only of biological diversity, but cultural biodiversity and landscapes biodiversity. Okay, this is the second part of my presentation about policy. Policy uh, is very important. Uh, it's very, it's very dense information because it's a lot of information about the conservation and management for conservation areas. And we have found here a policy before 19, but the most important information about policy in Colombia comes from 1999. After that, we have the act uh, 119. After that, we have mm, Policy from 1938, policy from 1946, policy from 1959, and these acts are related with exploitation, resettlement, promotion, and reservation areas of natural forests. We have another uh, policy from 1974, the Decree Act 2811, that is the national code for natural resources and environment protection this act was one of the most important in colombia and it was almost copy paste from a policy that were uh, used in chile before this year so it was very used we this was this was very used and very useful until 1993 when we create the ministry of environment and we create different organizations of conservation in Colombia. So we can find here in 1993, 1996 and 1997 different uh, policies. Sorry. That we can find here. 1993, we create the Ministry of Environment and organization and organizes the national environmental system. We have national policy of biodiversity, national policy of forests, and territorial planning for municipalities and districts. We have to the policy for wildlife management. So we can find in 2000, 2001, 2002, 2004, these other kind of policies. National plan for, for for the sustainable use, management, and conservation of mangroves. Ecosystems. National plan for, for forest fire prevention and control of restoration. A national plan against the certification and drug. have in 2009, 2010, 2011, and 2012. Another policy, national plan for migratory 
migratory species. We have a lot of migratory species that comes from North America to South America, and they pass from the north of South America uh, through Colombia when winters winters coming when winter begins in North America, and when winter begins in South America, they come back to North America. So we can find uh, a lot of species uh, in different kind of ecosystems, not only dry forests, but humid forests and Andean forests. National policy for research and innovation, national policy for management of water resources, we are one of the most uh, important countries around the world that we have uh, natural sources, natural water sources, because of the mountains of the Andes. And uh, we have here the National Council of Economical and Social Policy that calls national system for, of protected areas. We have protected areas created from 1960, but we have, we have this policy that supports a lot this kind of strategies of conservation. Uh, uh, we have here the Act 1444 to create the Ministry of Environment and Sustainable Development because it has another name before and to create the National Authority of Environmental License. This is a, a, an entity that has to do a lot of research in, uh, studies for different kind of um, exploitations. For example, mining, for example, oil, and they have to do this license to permit or, or um, forbidding this kind of activities. We have national policy for managed of biodiversity and its ecosystem services is a new information. We are in 2017, but this is very important information about biodiversity and ecosystem services. How is it uh, using? How is it related with, with biodiversity? These are national policy. And we can find international policy that Colombia has signed. For example, in 1958, we can find the Convention of Geneva. We have four conventions at Geneva uh, in 1988. Convention of the Territorial Sea and the Contigu Zone, Convention of the High Seas, Convention of Fishing and Conservation of the Living Resources and Convention of the Continental Shelf. So we are signatures of these uh, policies. We can find in 1971, we found the Ramsar Convention for protection of wetlands. Uh, we have in 1972, the Convention concerning the protection of the world cultural and natural heritage in Paris. We have in 1973, the CITES, that is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. We have in 1978, the ACTO, that is an Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. All the countries in South America that has uh, one percentage of ecosystem uh, humid forest. We have to participate in Convention for the Protection of Marine Development in Cartagena of the Caribbean region. In 1990, we signed the Caribbean Development and Cooperation Committee by the United Nations. The CBD, Convention of Biological Diversity, and the United Nations Framework, Convention on Climate Change. In 1994, we have United Nations Convention to Combat the Certification. Sorry. In 1997, we have this Kyoto Protocols uh, to the United Nations Framework Convention of Climate Change. In 2000, we have the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. 
In 2006, we can find the ITO, inter by ITO, International Tropical Timber Organization, that creates an International Tropic Timber Agreement in Geneva. And in 2015, sorry, we can find this uh, last COP21, uh, the United Nations Climate Change Conference that we have participated to. So we can find another um, title of my presentation and that is is related to wildlife. What is wildlife? Uh, now we know that it's a biodiversity, great biodiversity, not only in Colombia, but around the world. We know that it's a policy, uh, not only in Colombia, but around the world, that uh, pretends to conserve this biodiversity. And wildlife has part, is part of this biodiversity. Uh, but it has different definitions or concepts. Some of them, or most of them, are related to only animals, and another are related to animals and plants. So we can find that wildlife could be found as animals living in the wilderness without human intervention, animals that are not tamed or domesticated, animals except fish, whether or not bred or reared in captivity, Non-domesticated vertebrates, especially mammals, birds, and fish. Non-domesticated plants and animals, including insects and reptiles. Non-domesticated plants, animals, and other organisms. We can find here plants and animals. All living things, except people that are non-domesticated. Areas of native vegetation, which link larger areas of remaining native vegetation. Plants or animals not cultivated or domesticated by humans, and wild animals and vegetation, especially animals living in a natural environment. Uh, this is the most principal definitions that I found for wildlife. I know that different countries has different definitions and has different policies for, for it. And we in Colombia adopted a definition but it's only for animals. We talk about native animals, could be terrestrial or aquatic, uh, non-domesticated, neither genetic improved, no rear that had come back to their wild status, with all or part of their life cycle into the, into the boundaries of the nation. So they have to be into our boundaries, yes? We can find here an example of a Colombian mammal, that is the spectacled bear. It has a kind of glasses around their eyes, and this is their distribution all around the uh, Andean chain from Bolivia, Peru, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, and Venezuela here. So, this is a species that is wildlife for five countries, five different countries. Uh, it's, it's sharing a territory in these countries. So, I found an information that I found very interesting. Wildlife of Lithuania. Uh, I don't know anything about wildlife in Lithuania, but this map is very interesting because we can find different kind of uh, reptiles, mammals, birds, uh, I think fishes, <laughs> I think this is fish. The map is not very good, but I tried to find some information about Lithuania. And it is important to know that every country has a wildlife or recognized is wildlife. I think there is a vegetation here, yes. And just to show for you. But we have another kind of animals. Uh, we have exotic animals that comes from other countries that 
in this country, in that country, is an wildlife. It's a wildlife. It's an animal, as native animal. So this is a red panda from Tokyo, and this is wildlife in Tokyo, but it's exotic animal here in Lithuania and and in another country. And we can find domesticated animals that has been uh, improved genetically, yes, and they always accompany the evolution of humans, so they are not uh, wildlife. But we can find, too, some wildlife that is uh, domesticated, because I don't know here, but in Colombia, uh, there's a lot of people that has into their houses, they have parrots, they have monkeys, they have even uh, tigers or little, little tigers, and they try to domesticate these animals, and they always have uh, um, accidents because they bite or because they uh, run or run away from these houses and maybe have very different accidents with them. So we in Colombia tried to work too with four groups, four principal groups uh, of vertebrates that are amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Uh, wildlife is not recognized, uh, fish is not recognized as, as wildlife. Fish are recognized as uh, hydrobiological resources. There is another group because it's a very big group and the studies are recognized as hydrobiological resources. So we try to work always with these groups, even insects sometimes, some groups of insects. Why amphibians? Why birds? Why mammals? Why reptiles? Amphibians are vulnerable to environmental disturbance. They are less tolerant to water pollution and forest fragmentation. Reptiles are vulnerable to habitat disturbance. And because snakes are negatively affected by mythology, by hate or panic, we know a lot of people hate or are scared of snakes. And that is a big problem because none, not every species are venomous. And birds is the best known biological group. I try to work always with, with birds. I'm my bachelor, my doctorate degree was working uh, with birds. Uh, and they have the most popular attention in comparison to other zoological or botanical groups. And mammals, they need huge areas for the range, and they are under pressure by permanently hunting. And that is a great problem, especially when we are in rural areas, uh, because they are, we don't have a lot of uh, strategies for conservation in rural areas. I found this information at the internet uh, about biogeographical map around the world. Uh, we have, we can find 11 great biogeographical kingdoms. And this is an information from data from amphibians, uh, birds, and terrestrial mammals. How is this distribution of these groups uh, around the world? So they found 11 great biogeographical kingdoms. And here in America, there are two, uh, two biogeographical kingdoms, and we are here, right? So it's a very big area of biogeographical kingdom. So we can talk about, this is a classification, taxonomic yeah. classification. We can find here amphibia, reptiles, uh, birds, and mammals. And we know uh, amphibia and reptiles as an herpetofauna, as an only group. I want to show you some of the species that we have in Colombia for wildlife or herpetofauna. We have this amphibia class and reptiles class. 
We have three orders of amphibia. We have the Anura order, Caudata, and Gymnophiona. We have here frogs that doesn't have tail. We have here salamanders or tritons that has tail. And we have Gymnophiona, with, uh, which are Cecilias, with tail and without legs. This is one, an example for them. We can find for reptilia three orders, two, crocodilia. We can find testudines that are turtles. And we can find four squamata have three suborders. We have uh, Amphisbaenia. We have uh, Saurio, lizards. And we have snakes that are, that are Ophidia. Some of the species are these that are part of these families. This is one of the most common frog in Colombia. The distribution of this species is very wide. We have this kind of frog that is called crystal frog because they, we can see the heart and other uh, organs into the, into the body. We have this kind of frogs that are the venomous frogs in Colombia that has different uh, colors, uh, postematic colors that are red, uh, yellow, blue, orange. These other kind of frogs that we can find for different families. More frogs. I have a lot of frogs. We are the number one of the world, remember, in frogs. Reptilia, we can find the crocodilia, these two species, into the valleys of Colombia. Squamata, we have this species. Not all these species are from Colombia. This is not from Colombia. This is not from Colombia. This is not from Colombia. But we have this that live in Colombia. We can find them in Colombia. Uh, more snakes or, or suborder of Fidia. So we can find not venomous species, and we can find venomous species. Uh, this is an aquatic species that is venomous. Is one uh, I, we only have one species of, of this in Colombia. And this is another kind of uh, venomous species that we can find there. These are not uh, venomous. This is venomous. And we can, there are a lot of keys or a lot of information that we can use to know if a species of a snake is venomous or not. And could be the the well, for one of them is the fangs. Another is the colors. Another is the uh, the shape of the head, the shape of the of the eye. But one of the most common is the fangs. Here, this kind of uh, snake doesn't have fang. It's aglypha. Don't have fang. This is another that is opistoglypha that has uh, two little fangs uh, back in the back in the in the face, and we have two kind of fangs. This that calls protegroglypha and this that calls solenoglypha. This is retractable. Yes, they open the mouth, and and the fangs come out, and when they close the mouth. They're retractable again and close the mouth. And this is not retractable. This is fixed. We have turtles, this kind of turtles. This is our species of turtles. And we have more turtles. This is a uh, very important species because it's from humid forest of Amazonian forest. And they, they are in risk, in some kind of risk in Colombia, because uh, they are used by natural uh, communities, uh, rural communities, that they are uh, used for food. 
birds. We can find that birds has uh, have very important information because they have different food habits. They eat insects, shellfish, uh, arthropods, seeds, fruits, nectar, fish, other vertebrates, and they are omnivores too. This uh, kind of habitat can can be important for seed dispersal, for pollinator, for biological control. Could be insects or could be vertebrates, depend on the size of the animal and depends on the strategies of food. Nowadays, we classificate uh, birds because of their uh, genetical information. Uh, before, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, we classificate birds by its uh, nearest information about their bodies, uh, beaks, uh, legs, and just was very um, external information, external comparison for the for this species. Now we can have different genetical analysis, analysis uh, to understand what is their evolution and this classific and its classification. We have in Colombia, this is a map again of Colombia, we can find different uh, areas of endemisms in Colombia. We have here uh, um, Sierra Nevada, Santa Marta. This is a, an area that is a mountain near to the ocean. It has two top, uh, tops with glacial, and this is an area of endemisms isolated for the other uh, kind of mountain vegetation. This is another called uh, Darien, in contact with Panama. And this is another area of endemism. Choco uh, at the Pacific, humid forest. We have another area of endemism. We have the valley of the uh, Cauca. is another area of endemism. We have the valley of Magdalena. And we have this mountain of East Mountain in Colombia. There are five areas of endemism that we can find in Colombia. And for birds, this is for birds, right? Uh, for birds, we can, do, or we have to use a lot of uh, details for identifying birds. The beak is very important. It is a, the, the shape of the bird, of the big bird's beak. These are hummingbirds. And the legs are very important too, because they have different positions of their uh, toes. Okay, this wildlife has are part of the ecosystem, and we can find two different uh, characteristics into the ecosystem. We are going to talk about ecosystems. We can find a biotope and a biocenose that these are living organisms. And these are uh, abiotic uh, information or abiotic uh, uh, characteristics that are not non-living components called bi abiotic and biotope that are abiotic factors. And these factors could be physical and could be chemical. Physical, we can find light can find pH, water, air, solar radiation, temperature, wind, wind, latitude, atmospheric pressure, atmospheric humidity, and water uh, salinity. For chemical, we can find water and air quantity into the soil, minerals concentration, and quantity of toxic substances, and finally, quantity of dissolved oxygen. Into the biozoanalysis, we can find different kind of organisms. Here is an individual. What is an individual? It's just one uh, individual into the ecosystem. We can find populations that are uh, very a, a great group of individuals from the same species, and we can find communities that are 
groups of different populations of different species into the great ecosystem. So we can find some structure here at the ecosystem. We have the uh, producers that are is that is the first uh, trophic level into the into the ecosystem. We have primary consumers as uh, rats, uh, rabbits. We have secondary consumers and we have tertiary consumers. After that, we have these different decomposers or detritivores, and we can uh, assume that when we have all this chain until the fourth level of the chain, this is the fourth level of the trough chain, if we have this kind of species in an ecosystem, we can say that the ecosystem is very well conserved. And not always we can find this kind of uh, consumers because of the uh, deforestation areas or because of the degradation of the natural forests. And these are some elements that can be affecting or uh, the structure and functioning that is climate, time, topography, parent material, and potential biota. It could have different uh, effects on disturbance regime. Human activities could be modulators of the ecosystem processes and into the resources and the biotic communities. They can affect this uh, structure and functioning of the ecosystem. So we have some population uh, properties and some uh, communities characteristics. So our population, we have density, that is a number of individuals that live in a unit of surface. We have birth rate, percentage of new individuals who enter into the population, mortality rate, percentage of individuals that uh, die in a population, migrations, can be immigrations or emigration, growth pattern, uh, changes in the name, number of individuals, Distribution could be random, could be grouped, it could be regular, and size regulation uh, that is uh, that depends on abiotic uh, characteristics. As we saw before, light, temperature, salinity. Uh, we have relationships that are between members of the, uh, the same population. And community structure, we can find abundance, number of individuals per unity of surface, Diversity, variety of species for constitute the community. Uh, when we are talking about wildlife, we usually work with communities, not so much with populations. Depends on the focus of the research. But uh, generally, uh, biologists, ecologists, and forest engineering uh, works with communities, not so with populations. Dominance, <clears throat> species that stand out from the community. Habitat, that is the place occupied for the species into the physical space. Niche, role de developed by a species in the community. And indicators, some of these species could be indicators of the ecosystem structure or ecosystem uh, conserve status because they are species that are intolerant to physical factors. So we can find this wildlife or this biodiversity of these communities and populations into a forest and they has to locate in different strata. So we can have, you can see some stratification that could be strata horizontal or vertical. <clears throat> this is a, a vertical organization of the community into the strata and horizontal around the uh, white forest. Uh, we can find ground, species of the ground, species of the, forget the name. Sorry, we can find here uh, media strata, understory, this is understory strata, strat media strata, and we have the canopy, this is some kind of canopy, and emergent uh, trees. Not all trees has this condition 
to go upper the canopy. And we can find different species here into the strata of the forest. They, they are, there are some communities that goes together into the forest. We can find into the Andean forest different bird species that goes together for of different uh, populations in the different strata of the forest. But they all come together uh, searching for the same uh, kind of food or migrating from one place to another. We can find here this information about uh, boundaries. We can have forests, uh, open areas, uh, forests around the water sources. We can find some cultures, some plantations. Uh, and one of them could be act as a connectors or as a isolator factors to uh, what we can how we can study wildlife we have to make characterizations first of all we have to find secondary information we have to make interviews we have to research information we have to research for databases we have to research for reports etc and we have to be, to make some field work if we don't have we don't do some field work it's very difficult to know if that species that we are founding is really of this area or of this ecosystem. We are here uh, searching for amphibians, for frogs, into the night. We are searching into the day. We are taking some measures with some uh, elements. It's not so easy to identify or classify some um, frogs. We have to use keys. Uh, and have to make some measures. Uh, it's not so easy to to uh, evaluate or to study birds. We have to uh, open this nest, uh, this nest for his for its capture. Sometimes we can record the songs, and generally we have to make uh, direct observations with binoculars. It's not so easy, as I told you. Some of them are almost the same. This is one family called trogons, and this is one family called flycatchers. And each of one is a different species. You have to, you must have the species into the hand. You have to capture the, the species for identification. We used uh, some traps for mammals, uh, small mammals and medium size mammals we can find some of them here squirrels some monkeys and there is an important work because we as biologists or ecologists or forest engineering we always have to be a, a permanent contact with social community if we don't have this contact with them Maybe this work, this research, or the information that we have is not so valuable for the local, for the region when we are working. Uh, so we have to uh, know what they think about wildlife, why they use of wildlife, why they consider important for wildlife conservation. And one of them is uh, notes, notes to wildlife use. Uh, what is the season? Uh, in which the species are sighted, uh, where locations it is used. Not always. Not all species are used by communities. Uh, what kind of use? For what it is used? This species. Uh, what is used? If we are talking about uh, mammals, if is they use the the hair, if they use the the teeth, if they use the feet, I don't know. Uh, and what is the relationship with other species? It is important because if we want to make some ecological approachment, we need to know some of this information. And we are um, field workers. And when we are in field, we only stay in field by five days, 10 days, maybe 20 days but they live there. 
and the information that they saw and the experience that they have from the from time a lot of time ago is important to us as researchers so we have uh, information we can have already the information of field work and we have to make some analysis uh, so you have to analyze pressures and threats and one of the instruments of pressures and threats is the CITES. CITES is an instrument for threats analysis. Uh, it's a list that is called appendix and it has three appendix and we can find different species around the world, not only uh, from Colombia or other countries, it's around the world and we can find this species into the, into the lists or appendix. Vulnerability analysis. These are information of each species, what is important for them, what is the habit, what, what's their habits, because we can find rare species and dominant species and abundant species, but rare species are one of the most important. Endemic species, what, is, what are the, the species that only can find in this region or in this ecosystem? Which are the migratory species that we can find in some area? What are the species that has small populations? Uh, they are more important than they that have great populations. Species with pressure by hunting. This is, this is important when I am talking about uh, use and the connection with the communities uh, around these areas. Species with specialized niche requirements. Maybe species associated with caves or with some kind of trees or with some kind of vegetation uh, that is important. Species with aggregate distribution could be related with this. They are all together. Great species with high home range as the spectacle bear that I showed you before. This is a great mammal species and it needs a lot of uh, uh, its home range is very wide. <clears throat> risk analysis, uh, this is an instrument very important for, for us. The IUCN categories, we can find uh, critical endangered species, endangered and vulnerable. These are the most important for identifying areas of conservation, for identifying species that must be conserved. And we have another uh, uh, categories that are not so used or not so important as this, but it's important to know which information we have of each one of the species that we can find into the field. Another information or another analysis that we have to make for wildlife is rep uh, ecosystem representativity. If the ecosystem is uh, uh, great enough for conserve the habitat range for any species or for uh, several species, uh, fragmentation and connectivity. How fragmented is the area or how, how much connected is with our, uh, other areas of the ecosystems? If they have uh, different functions, maybe it's habitat and food provider, the animals come here just to sleep, just to breathe or just to eat and they uh, come back together to other area or they, the area is uh, using as a connector just to jump from one uh, forest to other or maybe it's a receptor, a bigger area that uh, can provide uh, habitat and food for a long period. If we identify all of this information, all of this analysis, we can decide if we have to monitor some species and how to monitor these species. We have to decide what do we monitor, what are the species more important for monitor, how do we monitor these species, who, who helps and who supports because we need some help into the field 
but we need to help for to go to the field some financial support some uh, institutional support what do we need for to do that monitor where do we monitor for what do we monitor how long do we monitor for how long and this is very important because we can do this alone as i uh, told before uh, we need help from the social communities that live surrounded these areas and maybe the help that they can uh, have for us is uh, for do these monitoring activities or to support our monitoring activities so we can have different i don't know if we have time okay we can find um, two kinds of strategies for conservation and management that are conservation in situ and ex situ. We can find protected areas, natural parks, uh, zoos, and hatcheries. It's not very common here, but in Colombia we have a lot of uh, a few experiences with hatcheries or breeding places. Um, I am going to pass this. What is a protected area? Um, I think one of is one of the most uh, important strategies are protected areas. A protected area is a clearly defined general geographical space recognized, dedicated, and managed through legal and, or other effective means to achieve the long-term conservation of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural values. So we have different categories of protected areas. We have uh, seven categories. And this is for strict nature reserve, wilderness area, natural parks, natural monument, habitat or species managed area, protected landscape or seascape, and managed resource protected area. This is a an, an, uh, worldwide information. The, we expect to conserve in terrestrial ecosystems uh, almost 70% of the of the surface of the world we are only in 50% in marine areas we we are trying to conserve until 10% of this of the areas of the world and we are uh, near to 8 9% of the areas of the world this is a map of the protected areas of the world This is a map of protected areas of Colombia. We have 59 protected areas in Colombia. And we have different management objectives, could be biodiversity, ecosystem services, cultural values. Biodiversity, we can find ecosystems, species, and fauna, and, and species could be fauna and flora. Ecosystem services could be water, but could be landscapes. And we have this information about the objective management could be could have a vulnerability, could have a pressure, and these two could create a risk. And we have to decide uh, some management strategies if we have to monitoring, if we have to prevent, if we have to mitigate or restore. Um, this is some these are some books related to conservation and management. Uh, wildlife in different areas that are usually used to logging or to a wood exploitation and we have these uh, books that are very important we have this information about all the contents of these books i consider uh, they are very helpful for uh, this kind of studies this is an, a, a book from Spain. These are the contents of all the books. And this is the end. Thank you.
thank you, Professor. Sorry, I, I uh, think I used more time than I... Yes, but I think that the audience have some questions. Uh, so let us start with our moderator. Dr. Martinez will give uh, one question. And after this, we will ask you to think about questions for the presenter. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I want to ask about the coffee fields. Coffee fields. Uh, you have best coffee in the world. And uh, it, it is interesting if uh, a coffee field uh, pollutes the uh, environment. You talked about uh, threat to um, forestry, or for natural forests, but it, it's also maybe uh, polluting uh, waters, runoff waters. Um, can you tell us uh, more about uh, hydro pollution? Thank you. Uh, yes, this is a very big problem that we have because into the process of the uh, after the culture, after they have the the grain for the process. Uh, it is a lot of possibility to pollute the the water sources sources so we have two problems the pollution of water sources because of the process of coffee and we have the deforestation of the natural forests because of the uh, culture and that exists some experiences of organic coffee in Colombia. So they have other processes of culture and they have other processes of, um, how can I say? Um, sorry. For the, into the process, they are different strategies. Not all the areas of Colombia that has coffee uh, has these organic uh, processes or these organic issues and they are more important are more relevant and because of that the coffee could be more expensive yes uh, and it's a, a coffee of a great quality that is export more than the other uh, processes of coffee or traditional coffee mm, it's a great problem yes uh, and some areas are trying to do the best for better this process and and to not pollute, to not generate pollution to the water sources. And, and but the deforestation is is the biggest problem. Uh, at the first part of your presentation, you were talking about uh, biodiversity and its issues. And I noticed that your literature, literature was quite old, for 2000-2004, yes? So my question can you repeat, is, please, can you repeat? Uh, your literature you were using was quite old, for, for 2000 and 2004. So yes. My question is, what is the current situation? But you can talk about what is happening now. What is happening with? Uh, with biodiversity. Biodiversity yes. in Colombia yes. or around the world? No, in Colombia. In Colombia. So we we have, I think we have a problem in Colombia because not all the people in Colombia knows that we have a lot of biodiversity. Not all the people in Colombia knows that we are the first place around the world in quantity of species of birds. Uh, not even the first in frogs, because frogs are not so uh, beautiful as birds. And we always talk about coffee. We always talk about another, or we always are recognized around the world for other things, different from coffee. Yes. And I think we have a challenge as Colombian people to present to the world what we have about biodiversity. We are one of the most important countries around the world that has uh, uh, water resources into these great mountains and these different vegetations. Each vegetation could change 
from one mountain to another. And we have, uh, as we have biodiversity of, of, or diversity of biological groups, we have diversity of our uh, social communities. So you can find uh, people that are uh, accomplished to conserve, but you can find people that doesn't care the conservation, doesn't care the management, and they doesn't care if we have a lot of species or we don't. Uh, we have problems with mining. We have problems with uh, oil production. We have problems with uh, uh, cattle. We have a lot of uh, great, great areas for cattle, for production of milk, production of uh, meat, and a lot of people doesn't care. But we have to try to convince them that is a problem and that are strategies that we can uh, uh, apply to conserve these areas. We have, I worked uh, for four years in a national park, in two national parks, and the buffer zone around the, the protected area, the buffer zone is always, uh, has always problems with the communities, social communities, because they have a lot of hunting, they have a lot of uh, cultures, not only coffee, but others too, and they are not uh, accomplished with conservation. So if you go to one strategy, you have to be uh, very strong with that strategy, and you have to do continuity with that processes, because you can work with one community for one year, for two years, or maybe six months, and you go away. And before that, uh, they return to their uh, activities, yes? So the process could be stopped in the moment that you go away. It's not so easy, but we have this challenge. Thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. Thank you. I am studying economics and sustainable business, and I have read some books about sustainability and how business is fighting with it. I read that some companies to solve this problem, they, if they use some paper, for example, they cut a forest and they plant another forest. And I want to ask, uh, when the new forest is uh, made, it, trees are in lines, and can ecosystem animals adapt to this environment? Because I think some species can have problems because of no natural obstacles. Maybe there is some. Can you tell me more about the issue? Because I don't think that this ecosystem is the same. OK, thank you. Uh, that is an interesting question because uh, I am a biologist. Uh, I work as a professor in the forest uh, engineering program. So they always think in uh, approach of wood. They always think in uh, timber, yes. But uh, my doctorate, doctorate uh, degree was, my research was in a native area from Brazil, at the north of, Bra of Brazil, and they uh, made approaching, excuse me, uh, exploitation of wood in natural ecosystems of humid forest. They have, uh, I want to present this, that tomorrow, uh, but they have an area that they don't touch. And they have an area that they have made an inventory and they know how much wood they can take off and they know how, um, where they have to take off this, this wood. They have some uh, corridors or some uh, rails to enter to the woods and to go back from the woods. And after the exploitation of the wood, they don't use 
uh, this area uh, anymore. So they can they can use an area for for example uh, 100 hectares. They made their, their their exploitation and goes away, and they left the forest to uh, restoration. Yes, this is a great possibility. I think is not so. Um, the impact is not so great. There is an impact, but the impact could pass away, and the regeneration processes you can you can see this regeneration process because the nature is regenerated by itself. Yes, we have other kind of exploitation of of forest of wood that is plantations. So we here in Lithuania and Latvia uh, can find some. Uh, plantations right or some forest for plant for wood mm, if we plant another a species to uh, help in the in the regeneration of the ecosystem if we are planting some native species in Colombia the process will be very delayed will be uh, is not so fast yes could delay at least 10 15 20 maybe 30 years because of the uh, nature of the species they are not from quick uh, growth they uh, they are not fast in growth but we can find another species that may be not native, but uh, sometimes uh, exotic species, and they are not an habitat. They may be not be an habitat, uh, but they can be used as a corridor. Yes, we can find some species that use some plantations as corridors. There are some uh, research about this, uh, comparing um, natural ecosystems with plantations into the ma great matrix and how these plantations or how this matrix can be used for the wildlife to distribute itself into one uh, area for another. N not all the species can use the plantations, not all the species can use the shrubs as I saw, as I show you in the presentation. Not all the species are using the secondary forests because we we know that there are some species that we can find only into the for into the dense forests. Yes, maybe we can try this uh, kind of strategies, but not all the species can use it. Yes, I don't know if I answered your question. But but it's like this. Um, the diversity um, of climate that you have in your country, as you have mentioned, it also brings diversity in the fauna. And you you have shown that plants are the ones that is you've got highly diverse population of plants. But you did not talk about the the use of plants as a medicinal source how common it is and um, more like ethnobotanical significance of the fauna of uh, Colombia can you please touch upon that okay thank you uh, we have indigenous communities we have nigger communities I don't know if nigger is a term that I should use <laughs> Uh, but we have communities of black people of the west, at the west of Colombia, and in the southwest, uh, the, we have indigenous people, we have rural people, and these three groups are very different of each other. And they can use, depending on the area, uh, they can use different plant species for different uh, things. 
medicinal, medical care, construction, and we have a, we can find different uses for uh, plants, even for wildlife, for animals. Mm, it's not so easy to make a list of species and they used because each community is located in different um, areas, as we saw. You can find indigenous communities in humid forest. You can find them in tropical forest. You can find them in dry forest. You can find uh, black people in humid forest, in dry forest, in different locations. So we have some studies about it, but um, but we have not uh, a resume or a compilation of information about all these studies. Yes, but we have we have a lot. Uh, I have a book. Even I have a book of four different regions with three different communities and the use is different of some similar plants. And so we have information, but I, I, I have no information to present here, but yes, we have information about uh, There are universities of research or researchers of different universities that depending on their location or the region, they assume that research. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we have another one question. Uh, so we all know that uh, different species of flora and fauna could be used like indicators of uh, yes. environment pollution. Yes. So do you have in Colombia uh, species of mammals like uh, which you used in monitorings or I don't know analysis something or just in monitoring mammals yes mammals we have some experiences uh, into the Andean forest because we have two great mammals in this area that is a spectacle bear and the danta they are umbrella species and we think that we, if we are conserving these great species, we can conserve other species uh, into the chain, uh, into the chain food. So we have um, some experience in conserving the spectacle bird and danta. Mm, I don't know if we are using them as uh, indicators, but we think that if we can find a spectacle bear and danta in some area, we are doing well, right? Uh, there is another kind of experiences that is related to coffee, organic coffee, in which we can find some uh, frogs, frogs that are endemic or frogs that are threatened, and we think the same. If we can find these frogs in this area that because of the coffee and processes of the coffee and the deforestation around these areas, we can find the frogs, we are doing well. Yes? Uh, we don't have much uh, support of if we are doing or not well these conservation strategies. But only the presence of this species, we can, find, we can have some clue that we are doing the good things. Yes? Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for responses. Uh, yes, uh, I want to summarize shortly. Uh, so thank you, Professor, from coming uh, from far away from here, from country where um, lives 10% of our world biodiversity. Thank you. It's a great place and also it's a great responsibility for you, and we wish you luck. Yes, uh, and uh, Colombia is uh, 
great country with thousands of species, hundreds of vegetation communities, uh, country number one uh, by biodiversity of uh, amphibians. Uh, also, it has a lot of uh, one and a half thousand uh, um, endemic species. I can notice that uh, in Lithuania overall there are only 1,050, 500 uh, plant species. Okay. Yes. So uh, our professor uh, told about uh, legislation that was intensified in the last decades and he has about 100 years of experience. Also Colombia has uh, all main convention signets like uh, Ramsar, CITES, Convention of Biological Diversity. Um, yes, uh, also it was very interesting some facts like migrating communities from canopy from the forests. It's not common in Lithuania. So interesting fact and also it was happy to hear that you are working with uh, uh, indigenous communities. Uh, you are evaluate local knowledge and uh, you use that six questions and uh, also thank you for main ecological uh, conservational concepts you presented for our students also. Uh, you presented principles and strategies of wildlife uh, management and protection. So thank you and I would uh, recommend uh, our students visit Colombia. I of think course. it's possible uh, for research. <laughs> I will be waiting for you. Uh, thank you, Professor, once more for your great presentation, very detailed answers to our concerns and insights. I think that the, uh, the discussion will continue our, after our event because I see many students very interested in your insights and very important issues for nowadays life. So thank you very much for coming to Shuli University. I uh, wish you a great week with uh, various events and nice discussions with other scholars. Uh, thank you for everybody, uh, for all participants online and being here in the audience uh, for taking part in this event. And uh, I would like to remind that Researchers Excellence Network is waiting for everybody in this week's uh, international uh, public lectures made by other scholars and um, you got all information about different lectures, so we will wait you tomorrow into different lectures of professors from uh, Brazil and USA. And on um, the uh, Thursday, we will wait you uh, in the Professor Urs Pinterich lecture about the future of European Union integration. I think it, it, it uh, has the interest not only uh, students from social sciences but from natural sciences and as well because environmental issues are very important for European Union as well. So thank you once more professor, thank you for all participants and have a nice afternoon.